everyone. I'm honored to be here. Uh, thanks, Nicole, and everyone at Vertical Crypto Art for a fantastic event. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, I'm Ashmi. I'm the founder and CEO of Mad Global. We are an innovation-focused creative agency based here in London, bringing projects to life in Web3 for fashion, luxury, art, and collectibles. And we have a fantastic panel here today, and I'm going to pass over the mic to have them introduce themselves. They all come from very different backgrounds and disciplines, so I'm handing it over to Danny. Hi, everyone. I'm Danny, and I originally got into the space through a content platform called This Outfit Does Not Exist. So it was around two years ago, and digital fascion was hyper, hyper nascent. I read an article where the CMO of Gucci said, we're going to start designing clothes to be worn fully digitally, and just something clicked in my head. And I started writing these 5,000 word essays on the potentials of digital fashion, and also wearing the clothes to engage both you know, the traditional CMOs, but also you know, the average consumer on Instagram. And I got back into the crypto space because I was originally in DeFi because what became very apparent to me was you had brands asking you to spend $500, $1,000 on these clothes, both in terms of games like Fortnite, which has 325,000 users a month, but also just through platforms like Instagram. And yet, these clothes were constricted to the platforms that you bought them in. So you didn't have the ability to transfer your identity to numerous platforms. You also didn't have the ability to monetize. And so I've now founded a platform called Drop, which is going to enable you to wear the most cutting edge Web3 native creators, but also port them into various worlds and finally financialize them. Sam. Hello, yes, uh, my name is Sam Jay. I'm a non-binary artist, and I mostly focus on digital queer performance art, ranging from video work to VR with motion capture and body scans. Um, I mostly just try to, uh, I don't know, express myself through my body and my identity and showcase what uh, being queer in Web3 can mean and how uh, we can lead to a more open and free, expressive Web3 metaverse, you know, however you choose to interpret that. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Duncan, and uh, there's kind of two strings to my bow. I have a background as a creative and art director. I started designing in magazines and moved kind of into agency world and retail. Um, so I'm partly here to represent Spring Studios, which is a creative agency with offices in London, um, New York, and Milan. And part of my role there is to head up Spring Labs, which is a kind of innovation department focusing on the web-free um, world and the metaverse and, and how we can translate that for our clients. And also on a personal level, I am the co-founder and creative director of Cash, spelled C-A-C-H-E. Um, and we are launching a mixtape NFT project with the kind of goal of making music sharing tangible and personal again through blockchain technology. Uh, my name's Chris. I've been working in the music industry for about 20 odd years um, as an artist. Um, I, I go by the name of Plastician. I run a record label called Terror Rhythm Recordings. Um, through the years, I've worked in various roles in the music industry. More recently, got involved um, with FWB, Friends of Benefits, as their uh, London Dow governance and operations, which essentially involves me putting on three events a month for our members to attend, um, including being involved in the curation of the music for tonight here um, in room two. Please come and say hello. Um, and yeah, I've kind of been in the web free space, I guess, since around 2017, just initially getting involved just as an interest, reading about it in magazines, trying to understand what Bitcoin and Ethereum was and why it, why it was valuable. So I just kind of went down the rabbit hole and um, being involved in the music industry through so many years and working in everything from you know event management, label, publishing, distribution. I've kind of got a lot of strings to my bow and I see the space as a potential um, you know like new revenue stream but also just a better way of doing things that we already do um, in the music industry and hopefully 
um, buy back some time for creatives, artists, producers. Um, so yeah, super excited to be here and to continue learning. That's super interesting. I think, you know, I think a lot of us sitting here today and also on the panel have kind of gone into this space and we always sort of refer to it as a rabbit hole that we can't seem to get ourselves out of. And I'm always quite curious to understand how these new mediums and technologies, especially, you know, some of the ones that you work with, especially you, Sam, you know, like 3D, AR, VR, is pushing this, this, this space forward and how, you know, what are you doing that is different than what you would be doing before, for example, and how are you applying the technology in different mediums to what you would be doing today? Uh, well, so my background is uh, that I studied graphic design in art school and I graduated at the end of 2019 and then got involved into NFTs a few months later. So my entire sort of art career has developed on the blockchain. And so it's very interesting for me to look back at the work I was producing as a student and then see how it's evolved to become more like Web3 native. And with that, I've really embraced things like AR and VR because before, uh, with the background in you know 2D design, animation, and um, things that are a bit more, I don't know, dated, I guess, you know. But um, I started moving and exploring VR just because it was simply available. I remember seeing the file formats that you could mint being like, you know, GIF, PNG, MP4, and then .glb. So I just did a quick Google search. I was like, what's a GLB? And um, that's, the, that's the file format of the 3D objects you see. If you see any um, VR NFTs, the ones that you can kind of spin around in your browser. And so I just explored from there and I messed around with like 3D scans and I just started by using, you know, the front facing iPhone camera and like all of my earliest NFTs, even as a video format, I would shoot with my phone. So then I started using the front facing camera to do 3D scans and um, in combination with makeup and also then physical paintings, also reinterpreting what I would put on my face. And it was just a big mix of all these different um, sort of creative tool sets that I had developed over time. And what excited me about Web3 is that people were actively looking for something new and innovative almost all the time. And so my experience in the few months in between school and Web3, I felt that um, trying to market myself to the commercial world, I had to really address the mainstream and what people were expecting to already understand and see. Whereas as soon as I jumped into Web3, I noticed that people were excited to find things they didn't understand and continue learning. And like this rabbit hole you were talking about before, like go deeper and deeper into it. And um, so I minted my first VR piece about a year ago, actually, in June last year. And I've just been exploring with it more and more. And I think VR for me is also really fun because I can work physically, which is something I really enjoy doing as an artist, and then also contextualize that in a VR manner. So um, for example, my projection mapping piece, some of you might have seen here on display tonight or today. It feels like nighttime. We're in a club. It's dark. You know, <laughs> like, But um, it's on the floor. And you know, maybe it's of all the cubes over there, if you've seen it. And I really wanted to do something physical that embraces the space we're in because it's such a cool venue. And then being able to then take that and make it 3D and interactable in the same way in VR, it was very freeing. And it felt like, um, you know, as I've discovered more and more about the, the future of these different mediums and the, the way that just this entire community is interested and also, you know, encouraging that development has been really motivating and inspiring. So would you, would you say that experimentation forms a big part of your process? I guess this, this question is for everyone. Would you say that experimentation in the space using different technologies and how to apply them to different use cases makes it, is that sort of your process on how you develop a lot of the art that you do? Absolutely. It's definitely a lot of trial and error. Um, I always, like for producing this piece, I made double of all the cubes just in case, you know, something might have happened. I'm always preparing for like catastrophic failure. So, and there's sometimes even when I was making the VR version of this that it just wasn't working and it's not a problem I can Google because it's not something that anyone has ever done before. So a lot of the times it's just tinkering and clicking different buttons and trying different things and being like, hmm, I don't know what that button does. Maybe that's why it's broken. Like just really messing around and um, I think like 
Um, failing is always really fun because then you learn more about what went wrong and you can better improve and iterate on the, the uh, process. And I think that's just something really native to crypto. I heard somebody tell me the other day when I was in New York for NFT NYC that we have never seen so many iterations of currency um, until the last like 10 years in all of human history. And so this just um, idea of innovation and experimentation and failure and growth is like really embedded into the culture that we have. So I, I just really resonated with that also when I got started two years ago and still now today. And Danny, can you, uh, you just shared about this new platform that you've launched as well, because I think interoperability becomes quite an important question when we're talking about how to translate and transfer, transfer different assets across different metaverses. Can you share a little bit more about the platform and your, your process behind what you're doing with uh, this outfit does not exist? Of course, and I think to what Sam J said and to what you were saying earlier, this core principle of experimentation is absolutely crucial. So I think, when it comes to fashion, what's very interesting and what initially brought me into the space was three things. First of all, the fact that when you look at the traditional fashion industry, it's an industry that is hyper-restrictive. So 20 brands capture 100% of the economic profit currently, and that's because they've erected crazy barriers to entry. And these span the fact that there's a super high production cost for new creators trying to break in. It's also the social fact of the fact that you want to get exposure, you have to be in Paris or New York or Milan or London and appeal to certain editors. And what originally got me so excited about digital fashion was that you could be from anywhere in the world and you could get your, cre your creations on a digital model or on a physical human like me through Render and you could start to use algorithmically generated assistance to get that exposure. I think the second thing that I think is super interesting and exciting is the way that technology can be integrated into the narrative. And I think, you know, digital art is at the forefront of demonstrating what this can be. And what I mean by that is that digital fashion is more than just digitizing a dress. It's more than just using an innovative material by digitizing a dress. It's also how you can integrate various technological means, so everything from creating generative digital fashion to integrating oracles, so you could have a dress that catches on fire when LVMH's stock drops, for example, to make what the clothes are expressing even more interesting and digitally native. And then I think the final thing that I was super excited about was the fact that these digital garments could actually become financial assets. And the perspective that I take on this is my background was in DeFi and then I was in innovation before I came into the digital fashion space. And what you see with fashion is it's a consumer good dominated by women and for numerous reasons, partially just the pure fact of wear and tear. So unlike a digital artwork where you put it on or a physical artwork when you put it on your wall and that's how you experience it, you experience fashion by wearing it. So the more you wear it, the, the less it's worth. That's not true in a digitally native context. So it's also thinking about how these assets can become financially viable assets. And that can be through rental. It can be through something called where to earn, where a brand would say, I'm going to reimburse you for wearing my outfit in the metaverse, and you can then link that back to conversion, or something like where to access. And these are just you know, a few concepts in this absolutely tremendous white space that we're dealing with at the moment. But the platform that I'm specifically trying to create is really trying to push all of these aspects. So creating digital fashion that is aesthetically, technologically, and financially creative, and using crypto to do that. And then very quickly to touch on this idea of interoperability. When I first thought of this platform, you know, the first thing I said was, you have to wear your clothes to make them valuable. And I think the way my perspective has slightly changed is this idea of utility that everybody talks about. I think you really have to break down in every single artistic class into this question of utility for who. If you're a collector, you might not care about wearing your digital fashion. You may just want to display it. And there's also this you know, challenge that we're tackling where you have platforms like Facebook or Instagram or Meta or Fortnite which give you the social clout that you need to really experience fashion, AKA you can interact with millions or billions of other people who say, wow, I really love your outfit. 
But with the state of crypto at the moment, yes, you have Decentraland, yes, you have Sandbox, yes, you might have select PFP projects, but it's very hard to leverage that clout or to get that social recognition because there aren't a lot of us in these spaces. So I think it's really figuring out what people want from the digital fashion layer now and also then what they're going to want in the next five to ten years. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then Chris, you know, you've come obviously full spectrum because you started and when you started in the space, you've also started working on the radio side of things and now you've sort of moved and you're doing a lot of work and projects in Web3. Can you give us a little bit more insight as to what that journey looked like for you and what projects you're working on now and how the technology is moving the space forward for you? So yeah, I think um, for my, my, my beginnings were like literally like, you know, in terms of music was buying records in specialist music stores where where I had to go to those stores because they were the only places that stocked the kind of music that I wanted to buy. So it was hyper-focused into small spaces, small venues, very small communities of people that had a like keen interest in the same sort of music. Um, taking that onto pirate radio, which was obviously dangerous, illegal, a little bit similar to how a lot of people would say Web3 is, right? It's like the Wild West, um, you know. So I come from... My background of kind of doing radio in that sense was quite similar to some of the backlash that you'll get now, like, oh, you know, you are NFTs, it's all a scam, it's this and that. It's like, well, I used, to, I used to get told I was a criminal every weekend for broadcasting on the radio. And it, it, this feels very similar in a weird way to the sort of experiences and um, the choices I had to make and the learnings that I had to make as well, you know. Yes, there are bad actors in every space, but you need to learn how to spot those and avoid them. And it was the same for me in music when I started out, it was like spotting the bad eggs, knowing when I was in trouble, being careful, you know. So like, there's a lot of things that you learn kind of like growing up, doing music the way that I did, that I've taken through various forms of work and life. And I think that one of the things that I see again, like in comparison to how things were done, is the sense of community is here again in Web3, whereas when like streaming and like downloads happened versus like vinyl, if all of these small communities exploded onto a global scale. Everyone had access to knowledge, music, um, and the communities that kind of have bred those sounds and those those events and the kind of movements that we read about in books and then watch films about now. And um, being a part of like a kind of Web3 community, you feel like you're at the start of something very similar to, you know, years ago I used to play at a club down the road from here um, in, in Shoreditch called Plastic People. You know, it's a 200 cap venue. Um, and for years we'd be playing like this music to about 30, 40 people every, once a month. Like we didn't ever think that it would be that important, but it was important to us. And once people had access to that music through the internet, it exploded and then dubstep was born and it became like a global thing. But that all started out of playing years in this little club to about 20, 30 people. And I feel like we're kind of like, that's where we are in Web3 now. It's like, not everyone has to understand it just yet, but they have to be invited in, they have to feel welcomed, they have to be educated. And, um, I think that's one of the main sort of like takeaways that I take from my, my previous experience into this space is like, how do we make it accessible for all? How do we make it as safe as we can? Um, and I think that just being involved in these kind of like community building, giving access to, but also one of the beautiful things I think is one of the most um, exciting parts of the potential for Web3, especially within music is being able to give back to people who partake and participate. Whereas before, you know, like as a consumer, you know, I might be on the stage um, playing my records, hoping that you will go buy them, stream them, pay for the next gig that I'm playing. So it's, it's almost like a bit of a one way. It feels almost one way. It's like we kind of get that the energy is kind of like given in two ways, two ways, but the value is maybe not as shared with the audience when I believe that being able to give utility back to people who attended the last gig or someone who turned up to the gig in that merch from thing. Like there's so many things that you can do using this technology that are maybe like quite complicated to most people now, but 
the space moves so fast that we're probably a few months away from someone building an app that registers your like attendance automatically you know like oh you, you know automatically downloading something like a po app that you can then use to like get early access to the next show things like that are, are what really excites me and i think that um you know like the the idea of community building is so strong in music especially within niche music genres and I'm, i feel like the web free space can really bring more of that back to the consumer as well as um, benefiting the artists that are embracing it too. That's great. And I think, Duncan, you also have a music NFT project that you're, you've worked on with Kashig. Um Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how you're actually doing some more community building around that project? Yeah, so the idea with the Cash Mixtapes project is um, we, as music fans, felt that the you know advances in the internet, streaming, everything from Napster through to Spotify has kind of slowly stripped the soul out of music sharing a little bit. You know, we used to, you know, you'd lend each other CDs. I mean, people would, back in the day, you know, have record parties. People would come together and share music. Um, and now it's just this kind of throwaway thing. You might send someone a link to a, a tune on Spotify or, or a YouTube video. And we thought a lot about this and we were thinking about the idea of a mixtape and how really that was kind of one of the last times when music sharing was, was really personal and curated and, and tangible. I mean, I'm not sure how many people in this room are old enough to remember making a cassette mixtape, but it was the kind of thing, you know, that you would, you would spend time over. You, you couldn't just shuffle the songs around. You had to pick the songs painstakingly. You had to consider the order. You had to think about, you know, the flow of the whole thing. You would write it out by hand. You would probably decorate the tape, maybe make a cover for it. So we wanted to bring this element back into, into music. So we're working... We have four DJs for launch. Um, we've chosen hip hop DJs specifically because mixtapes were so um, synonymous with the emergence of, of hip hop and the spread of that music in, in New York in the, in the 80s and 90s. And um, each one of them, DJ Vadim, DJ Yoda, um, Shorty Blitz, and MK, um, they have all picked their tape and it's all based on the tapes they used to use when they were making mixtapes when they were younger. Um, they've had a part in decorating it, obviously in naming it. They've done handwritten elements for it. So we've created these <clears throat> photorealistic 3D renders of, of cassette tapes, which are really personal pieces of artwork to the DJs. And they are being sold as NFTs, but when you buy them, you unlock a host of real-world utilities, the most important of which is probably an exclusive mix. That If it's a one-of-one one mixtape, which these first four are, you would be the only person in the world who would be able to access that, that mix from that DJ. And, you know, DJ Vadim, prolific DJ in the space, his is three and a half hours long. You know, it, it's, it's really the... <laughs> the thesaurus of, of 90s of 90s hip hop and um, his passion is, is evident you know some of the other DJs been working in the space in radio for years they have personalized shout outs from from artists like you know DJ Premier Nas um, Guru uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy you know all these things that their life interwoven into these tapes that they that they've curated and, and picked the order and, and hand mixed with, with vinyl um, scratching, etc., and um, and yeah, these are being shared. And obviously, some of the other utilities involve, you know, concert tickets, signed merchandise, sound, signed album covers, and things like that. So that's what we're working on at the moment. <clears throat> it's launched this week, and um, with a free mix from Cash that we're giving away. And um, but yeah, we want to grow it beyond just tapes. You know, we feel that these could be um, portals to unlock other experiences like an acoustic performance, uh, an in real life event or, or other types of music experiences. That's amazing. I would actually I also, you know, I would love to actually um, hear more about how you think that how some of these different experiences that all of you separately work on within your own 
uh, disciplines. How do these kind of fit into experiences in that IRL URL format? I think Duncan, you touched upon this a little bit as well. You know, how do you kind of see this? And I'd, I'd love to hear from you, Danny, as well, because digital fashion. Um, I actually went to the next museum in Amsterdam when I was there and they had a fantastic room that had been curated by Fabricant. And they had screens where you could actually try on um, digital fashion while you were standing in front of the screen. And it was such a visceral experience because you could, you know, without, I think sometimes the technology has to be at the back end of what you're experiencing and when you're consuming some of these, these this sort of very sort of iconic, um, points that are, that are shifting culture, right? So how, how do you actually see some of the experiences and projects that you're creating sit in the IRL, for, like in an IRL activation format as well? It's such an interesting question. And I think fashion is unique in the way that it has this intersectional category that we refer to as ORL. So to very quickly break it down, you have IRL or in real life digital fashion, which I see as digital fashion with a physical component. So it can be an NFT linked to a physical garment. It can also just be leveraging digital design in the creation process. Second type, which is ORL, is the stuff that I originally came into the space around. So the stuff that I'm wearing over there is by a fantastic designer called Larissa Pucci, and it's her brand, Falara. And that was a collection that DressX did where I took a photo of myself and they rendered it onto my body for use on social media. And then you have this final category, which is URL, which I see as anything in the direct to avatar economy. And I think what's really interesting is the variety we're gonna start seeing in the space and what constitutes an avatar. So it can be your PFP. It can also be your in-game avatar. And I think we're going to just see this in incredible diversity in how and who creates these avatars. And so then going back to this idea of the IRL, URL link, I think the most obvious type is this idea of forging, which Artifact did with their sneakers, where you own a digital, you can then have a physical counterpart. But I think there are also one of the most interesting applications that I've seen was done by Tribute Brand, that are one of the most phenomenal digital fashion brands. And they did these one-of-one -one NFTs where you essentially just got to listen to a specific song. That was what you were using to consume the good. And then the owner got a personally made piece based around that audio. So they didn't even know what was being created. So there's that very interesting element. And then I think the final very obvious transition that we're going to see is this transition to made to, made to order in the physical space. So the fashion industry is hyper unsustainable it's responsible for 10% of the entire world's CO2 emissions, so more than airlines and shipping combined. And it's hyper non-demand responsive. So unlike traditional industries where you say, okay, X amount of people want my product, that's what I'm gonna produce. The fashion industry produces and then says, okay, I'm gonna use advertising to make you want this. And when it works, it works, but then because there's this constant cycle of no, reinvent your identity, it ends up in landfill, and then it may not even get to the consumer, and there might just be a ton of dead stock which gets burned. So with digital fashion, first of all, you can use it to predict consumer demand far more efficiently, but you can also have a transition to a made-to-order model where you have somebody consuming the clothes and then only at point of sale does the, clothes, does the item of clothing actually get physically produced, which I think is really revolutionary for this industry. And most importantly, doesn't ask it to change the core tenets of reinvention of identity or of you know, consistent consumer branding and marketing that it's been based on for the past, let's say, 80 to 100 years since industrialization. Does anyone else want to add on how you would translate that to a physical IRL experience for any of the projects that you're working on? Chris? Duncan? I'd say, um, well, one good example is obviously what Friends of Benefits does in terms of like putting on IRL events for token holders, um, NFT holders, all sorts of things. Like, so the work that I've done there has been like a good example of like how you can kind of like give some IRL utility back for holding a token that then obviously gets you 
exposure to all of the other projects that they're involved with, like their festivals, their brand deals that they're doing with Reebok and um, Hennessy and all of these like massive brands. So I think that there's there's that which kind of already proves the the, the kind of use case potential for fan tokens for you know as from a music kind of perspective. Um, you know we saw this years ago with like fan clubs and it was just like you got a newsletter or something like that and maybe early access to tickets or you see it in sport with like membership so if you don't have a season ticket for a football team but you're a member you can get tickets that you can't get if you're not a member and you can I think more musicians that kind of as more and more people we give a lot of access to fans to people who are interested in what we're up to um, and just sort of like almost like paying off that interest and that the sort of experiences and giving a bit more utility to that. So yeah, definitely think that um, it's something that will make a lot of sense in the music industry. And Duncan, also I guess especially for you because you work with so many brands on the agency side, you know, as you know, we, we kind of have the same thing at Matt as well. What are the sort of opportunities and how do you actually pitch? Are brands kind of that you're speaking to quite open to this idea of um, wanting to layer on utility in an IRL format for everything that you're pitching in the Web3 space? It, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one that has shifted for me quite a lot in the last year and a half. So when I first got into this space, I was working... <clears throat> well, the re I first found out about Web3. I first went down the rabbit hole when um, a, an old friend introduced me to the concept of, of NFTs and... and um, digital fashion and like many people I was like I don't I don't get it like what what are you talking about and um, after I say like, kind of getting to know it obviously I made the mistake that a lot of people mistake uh, make which is thinking oh you could just make loads of money doing this um, which is not the right approach but then obviously as I learned more about it over time and I got more and more involved in it I kind of started to understand the community aspect of it the peer group validation aspect of it and, um, and that's kind of started to inform more and more how I look at the space when I'm talking to brands that I work with. And educating them on that, because that's something that they really don't get still. A lot of big, big kind of fashion brands or whatever who want to get into the space, they just think, oh, it's a PR stunt. It's something to make money out of. Um, how can we make some money? And their biggest fear is doing something and, and failing. And the way I'm trying to educate them now, and I think actually this, the crypto bear market situation actually has, has really leveled the playing field for brands in a bit because the PR stunts are over for now and the pressure is off in terms of them feeling like they need to deliver some sort of all singing, all dancing, Roblox collaboration or, or whatever. And I mean, I'm, I'm pitching to a, a kind of millennial... Gen Z focused multi-brand online retailer on, on Friday about how they should enter this space. And the advice we're giving them is very much like, don't kick the door in and do, you know, something in Roblox or, or what it like, you've missed it. You know, that if, if you want to do your PR stunt, you've missed your opportunity, you're going to look like you're late to the party and you're a, a follower. Think about how you can start to kind of plant seeds in this world and nurture them and actually grow a community, validate the people who are passionate about this, and then in return, they will validate you back. And that's the kind of approach that we're starting to take and actually, yeah, very much telling them that they, they shouldn't be doing the big PR stunt. And then one other thing that you mentioned that I wanted to pick up on is this, this kind of test and learn. Like the metaverse, you know, these games, they're an amazing place for brands to be kind of very cost efficiently testing and learning and allowing their fans and followers to input and help shape their collection in a very cost effective way. One case study I saw recently, Forever 21, whether you think of them as fashion or not, are you know ultimately selling clothes and they are on track to make $750,000 this year by selling digital beanies that have the word forever on them and they cost them $500 to make. And that now, they are gonna start making those in the real world, real world, and selling them in their stores because the metaverse has actually informed and, and, and allowed their fans to tell them what they want. 
and they can do more of this and brands can do a lot more of this and, and that's that community thing again letting letting the community kind of lead you and working with them rather than being top down which is what brands used to be like or still are sometimes Dan, can I also think you really hit the nail on the head with this idea of reciprocity and I think in music especially it's far more common than in the fashion industry that's used to just saying this is what fashion is and this is what high fashion is and part of the allure is that you can't attain it and all of a sudden it's this new relationship that they're going to have to integrate themselves into after hundreds of years of being untouchable and hierarchical and exclusive of responding to a consumer and listening to a consumer and rewarding a consumer instead of saying you're lucky to have this or you're lucky to wear this. But then in, in some sense, doesn't that actually go against what you were talking about on the sustainability side as well? Because if, you, if, it, if things are going to be sort of made to measure and you are educating the audience and the end consumer into this new way of thinking, but then you end up actually producing a lot more in the real world aspect, it's sort of, it's almost like a it kind of contrary. But you're producing the stuff you know they want as opposed to just producing surplus clothes and just taking a shot in the dark, which is what brands do, especially fast fashion brands, all the time. I couldn't agree with that more. And I think I see digital fashion as this amazing complement to slow fashion. You know, I absolutely love clothes. I would never say we're all going to be wearing a morph suit and living next to a green screen. But I think fashion is separated into things that you really want and you know you want and they're classic items and they're pieces that you've invested your time and your energy and your money into and the fast fashion trend. And with digital fashion, you can experiment with your identity and wear that crazy fuchsia dress that you saw on Bella Hadid in the digital world and actually become more of a considered purchaser while still expressing your identity and having that variety. And then obviously the second part, which is exactly as Duncan said, for the first time, brands can actually say, is this or is this not demanded? Should we or should we not actually produce it? And you know, the final thing is the drop model that's so common in NFT culture, also very common in streetwear. The idea of things being limited edition, small drops exclusive, is far more sustainable and demand responsive than mass production. And so while we're on this topic of identity as well, Sam, I'd, I'd love to kind of have your thoughts on that because you're sort of, you know, obviously a pioneer in the space where it comes to talking and pushing the technology forward in, with your art and everything that you do with um, this concept and this idea of identity as well. So could you maybe shed some more light on yeah, that? Yeah, I was actually going to add to that anyways because this idea of being able to explore yourself online without any, like, physical commitment to you know, altering your identity in any way allows for much more free and playful expression of yourself. And even if you just look at like VR chat, I think like 70% of the people in VR chat just show up as like anime girls. Um, and it's really interesting because they don't ever say like, this is an avatar I'm using. They'll say, this is my avatar. Like it's really a part of their identity. And it's a lot of these just like random dudes that are on VR chat that are using these anime girls in like tutus and thigh high socks. And that seems like so contradictory, but it's because there's this like low stakes um, boundary in that ecosystem and like the, the social setting for building up the models, the character models came from um, like, I, I can't remember what exactly it's called, but like K-pop, um, oh my god, sorry. Whatever, it came from like anime models to begin with because that's what was compatible with the game engine. So then it was very interesting to observe how identity and expression within VR chat evolved off of these anime girls given that it's still mostly men using the platform. Um, and I think that's something I personally like really want to get into. I've never used VR chat, but as an artist, like I really want to go and uh, you know, talk to some of these people and get their point of view because to me, I feel that way in real life. Like, you know, now I have this gorgeous long hair, I'm wearing a dress and heels. Yesterday I was not. Yet, you know, and the next day I might wear something completely different. Like, I really view myself as a, a figurine that I can dress up in any which way, however I want. And I try to showcase that and, like, 
help people discover that for themselves through my artwork, like lead by example. And I think as we see more uh, easily accessible and expressive things in the digital fashion realm, uh, not only like in VR chat or Roblox, but also just um, you know at the NXT museum or uh, I think recently at the Gagosian, they had the Murakami exhibition that also had some like filters with that. It allows for just regular people that might only want to wear a hoodie and cargo pants to actually explore something. And they might have never thought to try on a dress, but then they'll see this thing from Dress X pop up on their body and out of the corner of their eye, they're like, wait a second, what's that? And it'll open up a whole new world of uh, exploration. And, and like I said before, the Web3 community is always like very open and encouraging of um, you know iterating new ideas, including your own identity. Yeah, and, and I also think that, you know, I mean, the space is moving so quickly, so sometimes it does feel like it's hard to catch up with everything that's happening across different industries. And, you know, how do you actually see, you know, this question obviously is for all of you, how do you actually see, you know, cross-collaboration happening within industry and what are you most excited to see uh, within all the specific projects that you're working on? Well, I definitely agreed with what you were saying, where it's important to just plant seeds for these brands instead of try to do some crazy like blockbuster project because I don't know I've seen a lot of that stuff and most of it like completely misses the mark because it's people who aren't from web3 trying to do what they think people in web3 want and that's just like ridiculous you know um, so it for example Gucci just announced this like vault collection with one of one artists through uh, collaboration with super rare and I can appreciate that because they have also sort of been planting seeds in the NFT space for almost a year now, and then have also started working with established platforms to curate a well thought out list of one of one artists that uh, will represent their brand. And I can see that they're not only looking to profit off of the space, but really establish a legacy for their brand as this more tech forward, um, uh, sorry, I'm really, really slipping my mind. But um, yeah, they're trying to be more tech forward in general rather than just profit off of the space. And um, I'd like to see more brands do that for sure. I think that's the best way to just go being, about it. I guess, what, yeah. are you trying to say just being more in, in authentically inclusive perhaps? Yeah, and I, I recommend that for everybody, not just brands, but people as well. And, and you know, if you're DAOs or any form of, Endeavor in Web3, I think it's best to just get involved in the most authentic way you see possible and then just sort of develop a reputation and um, people will see you occasionally showing up to things and meet you over again and see you on the timeline or see you in events like this. And um, it's, it's interesting because there's people that I've met through social media and there's also people that I've really become close with as well that I've just met through going to these events that I actually have never really spoken to on social media. And um, I think that's just a really good, like, grassroots strategy for both brands and individuals. Does anyone else want to add anything? I'd add to that, actually, that I think, like, from a music perspective as well, it's always been, you know, pre-web free. Music's kind of crossed into fashion, culture, art. You know, it goes, kind of does, its, it moves everywhere. So I think that, like, this web free space is, like, kind of becomes more and more um, approachable, especially by like brands as so, I like music's always a part of en almost any um, campaign. So I feel like um, it's only like natural that we're going to be seeing more and more sort of like mu music collaborations with fashion, with art, with events, with you know social enterprise, all kinds of things. So um, yeah, I'm I'm super excited, and I think um, as we're saying, it's all about like. Allowing people access to it, I feel like the level of um, the sort of like barrier to entry has been quite high, and a lot of a lot of the sort of projects that we've seen in the sort of like the boom market where everyone's coming in and trying to price things out based on like the cost of a board ape or something like that, rather than looking at their core audience, that or or their buying audience in music. We always look at the the hundred true fans thing as like you know if you can get a hundred people to buy an album. It's, if you get 100 people to buy your album for £10 on like Bandcamp or something, that's the equivalent of um, that same 100 people 
listening to your album front to back every day, five times for a year. So you only need to get 100 people to just buy it. And there are 100, most artists will, will know 100 people that would buy it. But we got to communicate that to them. And it's the same with this Web3 thing. If you just put an NFT in front of your fans and say, it's 10 grand, you, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot before you've even got started. Like, look at the people who are engaged with what you're doing now and offer them a, a way in that is like not scary, that is accessible and that is like sensible. But show them value and show them utility. And I think that that's important. And I think, I think with music as well, especially that shared experience that you can have in, in real life, whether that's with a concert or, you know, uh, like, I, I mean, I think NFT NYC was probably very eye-opening for me from that side of things because I went to some fantastic events, uh, music events. I think Emanate did a fantastic one with Dead Mouse mm, and that yeah. was at the Brooklyn Mirage and it was... It was just, it was, it's just such a, it was such a pivotal moment in experiencing something shared, like, you know, everyone from the Web3 community was there, they showed up, and how do you have this shared experience, and I think music is such a sort of binder, and it brings people together, like, probably no other industry does, so I think, you know, having that in, in real life was... was it kind of sits on its own little layer on top exactly. of everything else, right? Exactly. It can kind of complement anyone's, anyone's enterprise, you know? If you're putting on an event, you probably want some music there. If, if you're making a piece of content, you probably need some music in the background. So we're fortunate as musicians and rights holders in that sense that we can find our way into so many different projects in this space and, and add value. So like as a musician and a rights holder, I'm excited for what might happen as much as anything else. And even, you know, like the metaverse and fashion and digital wearables, things like digital merch that people can buy. And there's like, there's so many ways into this space for music. So like token gated experiences and NFT. Exactly. For example, yeah, all of it. Well. Yeah. I think the token thing is really in interesting. And I think that for brands trying to get into the space, I think it's going to be less about, you know, certain high street brand doing a digital fashion collection and more about them looking at NFTs as tokens and gateways to experiences. And yes, one of those experiences could be a digital fashion garment. It could be a piece of artwork. It could also be a, a mixtape or a, a DJ playlist that only, you know, just to look at cash as an example, what we would love to be able to do is to work with brands and say, right, you, if someone buys those sneakers, you give them, you reward them with a mix from this DJ um, and only like the people who buy those trainers get it, you know, yeah, and exactly. they can experience it and they can then sell it on if they want to, but you gift that to them as something that they get alongside a purchase. So the kind of token aspect is, is really interesting. So I think we're going to start running out of time, but I wanted to open up um, the space just to ask a few questions if anyone in the audience has any questions for anyone on the panel. This is to Danny. I wondered if a collector owns a piece of clothing. Can, well, could I put it for rent on your platform? So the platform is going, so we're officially announcing the community launch in a week, but that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm trying to max out the financial utility you could get. So a clothing item would go from your wallet into your wearer's wallet, and then you would be automatically reimbursed for X amount of time that they hold it. Or in the future, you could do X amount of time that they wear it. Yeah. And then you could have a smart contract that returns it to you maybe with a power app, maybe with an additional signaler of provenance that could make it accrue an even more value after a specific time period. So nobody can steal your NFT, essentially. Perfect. Hi, I'm Papa. Thank you so much for hosting this. It's uh, really been wonderful to learn a bit about where the space is headed. I'm interested actually in, uh, you know, you mentioned being a plastic people and how that sort of lent and I've had some great memories and experiences there as well. Um, and I wonder where are musicians now uh, existing uh, in, in the sort of Web3 environment? Is it on Discord? Is it on Twitter spaces? Where are they showing up? And, uh, and, and is the album experience that you mentioned still how they're choosing to express their art? It's, uh, that's the million dollar question really, isn't it? It's, um, so I think like a lot of musicians are finding their way into this space still. There's a lot of, um, 
almost like anxiety around getting involved in the Web3, um, NFTs, all of it. Uh, from someone like I've been working on, on a platform on the side called Autonomies, which is going to launch soon, which is going to be like a music-focused um, NFT platform, which is going to be a little bit more, it's, and it'd be backed by a DAO as well, so the artists and the collectors will kind of, of it, like own the platform. Um, and one of the experiences that I've found from onboarding artists with that is a lot of artists are scared to say, hey, I'm doing an NFT because of the backlash they'll get from all of the naysayers that say, the environment, this, that, uh, it's a scam, it's a cash grab. And it's trying to like change that narrative, but also educate musicians into what, why would, why would someone want an NFT? What can you, what value can you as the creator give to it? So I think that trying to get more discussion um, Discord is something that I'm used to using a lot, and I think it's great. There's um, some great sort of like DAOs and Discords out there. Shout out like John T from the Willow Tree here today. Um, there's like um, Water Music. There's lots of good um, communities out there where lots of people share ideas um, online, mostly on Discord. I do find some quite good Twitter spaces as well, actually. That's something that popped up. Before it was Clubhouse, now it's Twitter spaces. You do find the odd one on there. Um, obviously, as a member of FWB, there's some, always some great chat in, in their music-focused um, Discord there. So, yeah, it's kind of everywhere. But I think the main sort of blocking point at the moment is the education to not just the artists, but also the collectors. Quite sounds like a rave is about to start. In, you know? It's nice, <laughs> but cool. Um, and yeah, I think that like the online communities are... It's still trying to tell people where they are. And I think that that is something that as an artist, I need to communicate more to my kind of like, my peers, make sure they get involved. Because a lot of them are really keen to learn, but they're scared because of the backlash that they might see. But that backlash comes mostly from misinformation and, um, and, and obviously like the fear of not knowing what they're really getting into. So I think we all have a part to play in being like a part of that conversation. Uh, we're we're going to take just one more question and then we're going to wrap. Sorry about the aircon. Uh, it's not the building taking off into the sky. <laughs> it's nice and cool up here, though. Yeah, like, so like, I want to start releasing my music next year, but like, I'm very interested in like the meta space and you know, like doing like meta concerts and giving people like meta merch if they're there for that one like show. But like, my question sort of is like, do you not think that can like drown? like a lot of artists out and just like annoy a lot of people if you're just doing too much of it. It's quite hard to hear, yeah. Um, so you, are you saying something about metaverse events, meta merch and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, so like, so I, I know like a lot of people do like meta concerts, but I'm saying like, do you not think doing too many meta concerts as an artist and like offering people like too much like meta merch for like coming to like this one event or whatever can like sort of tarnish like an artist's like reputation in like a sense. I, th I think it's like anything, isn't it? Like in, as an artist, as a, if you're an artist, if you're a musician, if you, if you give too much access, it kind of devalues the point of like holding something. So I think that you have to think carefully about the product as well. So if the product is access to a metaverse gig, then price it accordingly based on what you think that that experience is worth and how many people you're going to let in stuff like that whereas there's also the opportunity to offer like IRL merch IRL events stuff like that which maybe like people who are a little bit newer to the space would apply a like higher tangible value to because they're used to paying x amount for a ticket for a festival or a gig or so I think um yeah it's like anything if, if you overdo it too much it kind of devalues the holder, like the access to those things. So it's definitely something that's thinking about. And but I do think that like, I love the idea of like the meta, the metaverse kind of like gigs and concerts and access to that because of the sort of barriers they break down for people. Um, I was involved in a VR live streaming um, company for a couple of years back in 2017, and some of the feedback we got from that were from people who had disabilities or just really like had crippling anxiety and just didn't want to leave the house but wanted to have the experience of kind of being at a show interacting with the other people that were at the show 
So I think that these are massively important things that artists shouldn't just overlook. Like, oh, I want to do Web3, but I don't want to do Metaverse. It's like, if you do those things and realize the value that people have, and I'm sure some of the panel can speak to that as well, that like, that is the beauty of those events. And I think that they are important, but like you said, if you do it, if, you, if it's just that, or if it's too much about that, it will start to like water down the kind of like the point of the access. Okay, that's an amazing note to end on. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for being here um, and enjoy the rest of the day. There's lots of other panels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.